This is a Samsung N210 netbook. It has an Atom CPU, Windows 7, and you wouldn't look twice at it if you saw it in a pile of trash. But it's about to do a trick, so watch closely. Right now, we're in Windows. I'm gonna click this icon. And now we're in something else. Then I'm gonna click this other icon. And we're back in Windows again. Would you guess that what you just saw was two completely different operating systems? Probably not, but I assure you, we just exited Windows, switched to a completely different OS, then went back to Windows in the space of 40 seconds without rebooting. And I promise you can't guess how that's possible because there's no other PC ever made that did what this is doing. Welcome to episode four of Quick Start, a show about fast booting built-in operating systems that were all forgotten 15 years ago for very good reasons. Uh, if you want the full backstory, you can watch the previous episodes, but it's not necessary. Here's what you need to know. Circa 2007, a lot of computers, especially low-end ones like netbooks, started to take a really long time to boot, partly because hard drives were slow and SSDs weren't yet very common, and partly because Windows got a lot bigger and more complex when Vista came out. PC builders mostly just ignored the problem and let computers be slow and miserable for a few years, but some companies tried to actually solve it. But they couldn't make Windows any faster, and they wouldn't sell you better hardware for the same prices, so the most common solution was to offer a second, lighter weight operating system that you could boot into instead of Windows. Previously in this series, we've looked at a laptop from Sony that took four minutes to boot, but only 30 seconds to boot Linux. But unfortunately, all it could do in Linux was play DVDs. We also saw Asus ExpressGate, another incredibly bare-bones Linux distro that went almost unnoticed by everyone who had it, even though it shipped on millions of motherboards and laptops. And finally, we saw Dell's bizarre solution in which they shipped two copies of Windows on the same machine. So far in this series, we've seen nothing truly remarkable. So far, it's just been a bunch of machines set up for dual boot, basically. They use some minor tricks in their startup processes, but nothing we haven't been doing since the 90s. And we'll see more boring solutions like those before this series is over, but not today. Those last few videos were just to soften you up and get you complacent. I showed you the lazy solutions. Every vendor had people looking at this problem, and as I've slowly learned over the course of my research, some of them had no conscience and no fear of heaven's wrath. Today, we will descend into the psyche of madmen. And what better way to lose your mind than to be the CEO of a tech business that's not profitable? For very good reasons. To set the scene, let me first uh, pontificate on a subject I know almost nothing about. That's what I do here. Virtually every PC clone ever sold featured a BIOS made by one of three companies. Uh, American Megatrends, also known as AMI, Phoenix, or Award. In other words, as far as I know, 90% of the firmware on every motherboard ever sold was basically identical. I've been told a little bit about why it works this way, but it's weird business nonsense that I don't really care about. What matters is that those three companies underpinned the entire PC clone market from its beginning to this very day. Over time, however, that field has gotten a lot narrower. Uh, Phoenix bought a ward in 1998, and that left only two companies in the market. They continued selling the highly recognizable Award BIOS for a bit, but it petered out, I think, sometime in the 2000s. And eventually, it seems that Phoenix themselves kind of drifted out of the game. At this point, I think virtually everything is AMI. Uh, here's an Asus ROG Strix B760F. It's a brand new board that runs 13th gen Intel chips. BIOS copyright, AMI. Here's an MSI Z790 Godlike, also brand new. BIOS by AMI. Gigabyte Z790 Aorus. AMI. I could probably dig up more of these, but in short, it looks like AMI utterly dominates the PC market, and things were probably starting to slide that way already by the mid-2000s when our story begins. Circa 2007 or so, Phoenix were having financial troubles. There were still plenty of machines being sold with their BIOS, uh, particularly laptops for some reason, but I think they were starting to see the writing on the wall. They were losing the BIOS market, 
they didn't really know how to stop it, and they weren't really sure where to pivot, so they did what a lot of businesses do when they realize that their relevance is about to come to an end. Is that go out of business since they're no longer useful to anyone? No, of course not. They hired a new CEO who did exactly what all new CEOs do in this situation. He fired nearly everyone, then began spending money on a bunch of stupid bullshit that made no sense. Phoenix began buying up other companies at a furious pace, acquiring some truly awful products, including, I shit you not, a driver finder. <laughs> That's right, this company thought that their path back to success might include selling one of the most prototypical and banal forms of malware in existence. Now on its own, this would just be the pathetic flailing of a corporation in its death throes. But what's truly remarkable is that as this weak shit was going on, Phoenix also began developing their own original software. Now they'd actually been doing that for a bit. Uh, if the unsourced data on Wikipedia that I can't corroborate is to be believed, that's actually what put them in the toilet to begin with. But even after they panicked and decided to pivot into selling weird fraudulent crap, they continued to come up with completely new software products. One of those was called Phoenix Hyperspace, and that's our topic for today. This is one of the very few machines that ever shipped with it. This is another of them, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. That's not the cool, this is the cool one. On its own, the Samsung N210 is an average netbook. It's about 10 inches, which is perfect. I don't think they should even make laptops bigger than that. We've got three USB ports. Um, it's got VGA, full-size RJ45, there's an SD card slot on here. It feels pretty well built. Uh, the trackpad is better than the Lenovo S10 III, which isn't saying much. The keyboard isn't the worst, and the screen is eminently passable. Probably not very good outdoors. I've seen worse, okay? The CPU is an Intel Atom, as was typical for netbooks. It's an N450 1.6 to be precise. Uh, it shipped with a gig of RAM, uh, which isn't terrific either. It came with Windows 7 Starter. Not Vista Starter, as I asserted in the last video. Whoops. And I've run the full system recovery. It came with the hard drive partition, so it should be running exactly the way it did when it left the factory, complete with all of Samsung's pack-in shitware. Let's go ahead and fire this up. All right, that was around a, a minute 10 or so, but you can see that the desktop comes covered in all the usual garbage. We've got 10 different weird Samsung apps. We've got a Microsoft Office trial, Easy Network Manager, any PC, Cyberlink UCAM, some big ugly shovelware casual game store that's actually just a bunch of demos and ads. And of course, let's not forget McAfee. Come on, McAfee. You are rendering the computer unusable. I can't uninstall it because I still got to shoot B-roll of me insulting McAvey. God, I hate this thing. So this machine is no powerhouse to begin with, and it is straining under a bunch of bundled garbage. And despite all that, it really doesn't take that long to boot. That was about a minute 10 by my clock, and I've seen it boot in about a minute flat. It's using the original spinning hard drive, but it only takes about a minute to boot, and that's fine even by modern standards. And if you don't actually shut down, but rather use sleep or hibernate, it's even faster. Hibernation works perfectly fine on this machine. Here, let's see. Let's go to start, hibernate. All right, we're off, so let's power this up and see how long it takes. All right, that was about 25 seconds from power on back to a usable desktop. These are perfectly reasonable delays, and they're what you would have gotten 13 years ago when this machine was new. So just like the Dell laptop from the last episode, this machine doesn't really have the problem that we're talking about, 
But also like that machine, it shipped with a fast boot operating system to solve that non-existent problem. You can see on the sticker below the keyboard, it says Phoenix Hyperspace Instant On. This system came with a solution to a problem that it doesn't appear to have. I'm front loading all of this because I don't want anyone waiting for a punch that isn't coming. If you've been watching this series so far, you'll know that the real story with these quick start OSs is that they all seem to be pointless. They were either so limited as to make them useless or there was no actual problem needing to be solved as far as I can tell. So we're past that. These solutions were all developed for bad reasons. It's the implementations that we're really here to see. So let's start seeing. During the intro, I clicked an icon on the Windows desktop to jump into hyperspace. That's what that was. We're gonna see how that worked under the hood later, but we'll start by looking at what hyperspace actually is, starting with how fast it boots. As with a lot of machines that came with instant on OSs, this one is assisted by a slightly modified BIOS. So we're gonna power on here and let's see if we can pause this. All right. You can see this little strip down here that was a uh, typical of Phoenix BIOS from the era, uh, this little gray strip that tells you all the options that you can choose. So we've got F2 for BIOS setup, F4 to launch the recovery partition, and then F6 to launch hyperspace. You can actually set this machine up to boot into hyperspace by default. Uh, right now it's configured so it boots into Windows unless you hit F6, but I'm actually gonna go set it up so it boots into hyperspace directly so we can see how long this takes. All right, I just set that to boot hyperspace directly, so let's fire it up. All right, and there we are. That was about 30 seconds by my watch, so we're looking at a 30 to 40 second improvement over booting Windows. Now I've given this opinion several times in this series, I'm gonna give it again. That doesn't really impress me. A minute is not that long to wait and 30 seconds isn't that much faster. You hardly notice the difference. Anyway, now we're here, so what do we have? Well, as you can see, Hyperspace doesn't have a conventional desktop user interface. It's a kiosk style UI, like you'd expect from a public PC in the library, something like that. It's completely locked down and sanitized, but you can tell at a glance, it's actually still fairly capable. So let's see what it offers. The first item on the desktop, for instance, recent. This shows you a little screenshots of each of the apps you've launched on here recently. Obviously not great for privacy, but since it lets you jump straight back to whatever you were doing the last time you had it on, it is definitely convenient. There's also this list of shortcuts here. This is the weirdest thing in the OS. You can't customize those or anything. They, uh, they seem to just be like, uh, you know, if this is your first time using the OS, these are suggestions of things you can do. Uh, why it takes up so much screen real estate with that forever, I don't know. We then have a quick launch bar for a number of apps. We'll go through all those in a little bit. And then the rest of the screen is a series of widgets. Now widgets are kind of a software meme. They've been all over the place for decades. They come and go and it feels like nobody's ever really cared about them even though they're a neat idea. The concept is that you have little programs, little single purpose applications that take up very little screen space, very little memory. They usually live only on your desktop. It's a cool concept and it goes all the way back to the very first Mac OS from 1984. That had a whole second class of applications called desktop accessories that included things like the calculator. Apple, I think, still offers widgets even in the newest Mac OS. Uh, maybe they took them out at some point, but they were there last time I looked. Android still supports them as well, and they show up in other places, I think, but I hardly ever see anyone talk about them. And while they did show up in Windows, they were only there for a few years. They were in Vista and 7 and then disappeared. I'm not saying that they're bad or that nobody wants them. It's just that for some reason, nobody seems to care about them. They just come and go with the current zeitgeist. Anyway, they were still very much in in 2010. So we start out with widgets for uh, Gmail and Twitter and the weather, which of course doesn't work since the web APIs have long since been replaced with newer ones that do the same thing but are incompatible for no reason. Then there's a BBC World Edition widget, which actually does still work. This is current news, or at least, well, it was current as of the last time I had this thing on the Wi-Fi. Let's fix that. Ah, there we go. Today's headlines on this computer from 2010. <laughs> That works probably because it's reading an RSS feed. That's my guess. RSS will work forever until some soulless VP has it taken down out of sheer unbridled malice. So these are pretty neat and there's actually a bunch more of them. If we go up and hit 
change this page, we've got all this extra stuff. We've got uh, stonks, we've got a to-do list, a uh, currency calculator, and then we have a notepad, a photo album, a regular calculator. Uh, this is the Twitter and Gmail we saw already. And then we have a bunch more news sources. I haven't tested all of them, but probably at least a few of them work. So as widget UIs go, this is actually pretty loaded. Usually when I see this sort of thing in an older device like this, it's got three or four default options, and then you're expected to go get more from some website that's you know, invariably long gone, if anybody ever uploaded anything there at all. That's how the Windows Vista sidebar worked, for instance. There were tons of widgets for it, but you had to go get them. And the website's broken on Internet Archive, so sadly I haven't really been able to deep dive the sidebar like I always wanted to. Uh, but in this case, Phoenix decided to include quite a few useful tools built right into the OS. Uh, you can even create multiple tabs up here at the top. So if you can't fit all the widgets you want on one page, you can just spill over to another. And as you can see, these are nice and compact while still being fairly useful, even on this low resolution screen. So this is pretty neat, if you ask me. And if there is any central ethos to the instant on OS concept, it should have been the idea that you should be able to turn on your computer, do a very small amount of work, and then turn it right back off inside of you know a minute or two, much like we do with smartphones nowadays. Those weren't universal yet, so they were trying to find ways to make tiny laptops do pretty much the same thing that Android and whatnot was doing at the time. This UI delivers on that promise by minimizing the required actions to use your machine. Instead of booting it up, waiting for a bunch of silly system tray programs to launch and check for updates, and then opening a browser and manually navigating to a bunch of different websites to collect all the resources you need, you instead just Open your laptop, wait a few seconds for it to boot, and you're instantly presented with access to apps you recently used, news headlines, your email inbox, Twitter updates, and a forecast, all laid out on one screen. Even a modern tablet can't usually deliver that kind of UI efficiency. So at a glance, I kind of love Phoenix Hyperspace. This user interface is very space efficient, and it seems to serve the interests of the on-the-go data fiend of 2010 that couldn't yet afford a smartphone. And if that wasn't enough, Hyperspace also delivers a bunch of actual software. And I mean, for real this time. In the lower left of the desktop, we've got this quick launch bar. We've got a browser, a media player, a notepad, and of course, settings. But all these sections on the left are expandable. If we expand apps, we find out there's a lot more here. Now, a few of these, of course, are just links to web pages, typical for the time. Uh, Photoshop, Amazon, Mebo, and of course, you know, Blogger and Facebook. Those are all just shortcuts to websites, but everything else here is actual software. Skype is Skype, mm, uh, as is RealPlayer and the web browser, which is, of course, Firefox. Let's go ahead and fire that up. Fire. <laughs> I love this little interstitial dialogue it does here. It's just launching a program like normal. Like I've dug into it and found out that's not doing anything special. It just gives you that interstitial dialogue to let you know the program is loading. There's no real need for that as far as I can tell, except that, well, maybe they thought to themselves, perhaps people will use this that aren't super computer savvy. And if we were developing an operating system, which we are here at Phoenix Technologies, then maybe when you launch an app and it's taking a while to start, it should do something more than just show a spinning mouse cursor. Because, you know, everyone watching this video has watched somebody open six copies of the same program because there was no indication that it was taking a long time to load. Probably most of us have done it ourselves. So it's neat that Phoenix decided to just add this here just because they had the opportunity. Now, for some reason, the Wi-Fi on this machine, even though it is uh, 802.11g, and I know it works, you know, it worked well at home, it's taking so long to download anything here that uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to demonstrate any of the online features. <laughs> Not that there are very many. I think the uh, 2.4 gigahertz band around here is just super clogged. So I'm gonna have to drag over an ethernet cable. One moment. There we go, that's a lot better. So this is Firefox, and I've seen Firefox in every instant on OS that I've looked at. That's always the bundled browser. But usually it's stripped down to the bare bones, just the absolute minimum viable product. In this case, they've actually left it pretty much unchanged. If we go look at the menus here, for instance, you can see these are the original Firefox menus. Pretty much nothing's missing. We've even got stuff like the uh, Diagnostic Console. And uh, in fact, if we go to File, we can 
save the current page, which we can't do on any of the other Insta on OSs. And if we go to edit, we even have the preferences window, pretty much exactly as it is in a normal desktop copy of Firefox. So in fact, it might even be possible to install add-ons on this thing, but I haven't tried because I don't know where to get any that are appropriate for 2010 Firefox. This is neat that they left it so unchanged. It's been, you know, dressed up. They've given it a skin that's, you know, kind of outdated looking even for 2010. It's got that heavy gradients, Vista-y kind of design that was already on its way out by then. But, you know, it's not offensive. And since this browser is only 13 years old instead of 16, there's a few more websites that'll actually work than you'd expect. But like most older browsers, most websites just throw a TLS error. For instance, if we try to go to archive.org, we get nothing because there's a whole bunch of connections failing behind the scenes, so it can't load in any of the resources. But we can assume that when it was working, it worked just like any other Firefox of the time. Anyway, let's move on to the next app. That would be RealPlayer. Now, this is kind of funny to see in 2010. I thought at this point that RealPlayer was pretty much dead. And I mean, media players, uh, free and commercial, were a dime a dozen at this point. So it feels like kind of an odd choice. But apparently this is native RealPlayer for Linux. Who knew that existed? At any rate, it seems serviceable. This supports MPEG-4, which was a popular video codec for the era. So I can pop a video in here and it'll play it, no trouble. Although it definitely won't do HD. It also, of course, has a media library mode that's, you know, serviceable like any other. I can't get it to scan my USB drive, but uh, I did get it to scan an SD card the other day. It'll import MP3s, it'll play them. What else can you really ask for? Well, I guess you could ask for some visualizations. It doesn't have those, but anyway. The other apps on here are Files, Sudoku, Tetris, Calculator, Notepad. Those are all ordinary Linux apps like GNU stuff. Uh, if we open Notepad, for instance, this turns out to be a completely ordinary copy of the GNOME text editor, Get It. You, you get it? This is a reasonably capable plain text editor. It's even got a tabbed interface. Nothing really notable here, except you'll notice that it's maximized and you can't restore it. You can only minimize it or close it. Every app that runs on here runs exclusively in full screen mode. And I think that was just kind of the style of the time for the kind of OS that this is. Remember that this was 2010. So if you were designing a new user interface for a portable device, you had a lot of things to look at for inspiration. There were tons of mobile only operating systems at that point. Uh, for instance, iOS, Android, WebOS, and Symbian. And even on the PC itself, Intel was trying to popularize an OS that they developed called Moblin, short for Mobile Linux, hoping it would become popular on Atom-based netbooks like this one. That project eventually merged with a separate Nokia initiative to do the same thing. Theirs was called Mamo, and they merged into a new thing called Mego. And all of those, plus all the other OSs I listed a moment ago, used single tasking interfaces. It's just like on a phone or a tablet now. If you're in one app and you want to use another, you have to switch. The new one takes over the whole screen. You can't overlap two applications. I mean, yes, at times they have made that possible. It is possible now on modern iOS and Android. But in general, okay, that's a power user feature. The basic UI concept is that you have one app running at a time and it dominates the whole OS. So I guess Phoenix looked around and said, well, this is gonna end up on these little tiny super portable subcompact laptops. So this is basically a mobile device. Let's go with the flow. This is how it's done. So when any app is running, it dominates the screen and you can either minimize it or you can alt tab between open applications. But a weird thing about this is if you do minimize it, it just kind of, goes away, it's just gone. There's no taskbar or anything. So if you wanna get back to that app, you have to either alt tab back to it, or you've gotta find its icon on the desktop and click on it again. And that feels kind of odd, this being a PC. But again, if you look at Android or iOS, same thing. If you close an app, it just goes to the shadow realm and you have to know the right techniques to get it back. That must confuse the hell out of older people now that I think about it. Now this exclusive full screen thing has one funny side effect. If we go in and launch the calculator app, all right, this is the normal GNOME calculator app, calculator name. 
And it wouldn't make much sense to maximize this. It doesn't really scale, so they didn't do that. It's the normal size, but it's it's stuck in the middle. You can't you can't move it. You can't put it over any other apps. It's just floating here on an empty desktop. And this is a silly decision. I see how they got here, sort of. They wanted consistency, but I mean, come on. The desk accessory concept that was invented on the original Macintosh, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, that existed because even on an OS with no real multitasking, Apple recognized that you needed to be able to hover tools like a calculator over other apps. Otherwise, you won't be able to see the numbers that you're punching into the calculator. So yeah, this is wacky, but I see why it happened. I'm not gonna go through all these programs. They're all pretty much what you'd expect, but there's three apps that I didn't mention yet because they're really something special. They're all part of one package and they're called Write, Calc, and Show. Those are complete replacements for Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Here, let's open Calc, you'll get the impression. You can tell at a glance that this is just a clone of Excel 2003. And the same goes for the other two apps. We don't need to open them or test them or anything. They're exactly identical to Office 2003. What's actually wild about this is that you'd figure this would just be OpenOffice. That's uh, what LibreOffice was called back then. I think they forked or something, but OpenOffice was around. It was free. It was included with lots of versions of Linux, but for some reason, that's not this. This is a commercial package Let's go to the about here. This is called Think Free Office, and it's made by a company called Hansoft, Hansoft. They're uh, South Korean, never heard of them before. Somehow they ended up here. That's weird, right? You'd think that Phoenix would have just gone with the totally free thing. I'm not really sure what they got out of licensing this. I, I assume they paid for it. It was a commercial product. Weird. In any case, a complete office suite really rounds out the software selection here. I mean, honestly, how many people actually need more than what we've just seen? You've got a web browser, a media player, an office suite. For an awful lot of folks, even this is overkill. This thing is loaded. So, what are the drawbacks? Well, what you see here is all the software that you'll ever see in this OS. Like the other operating systems we'll see in this series, hyperspace is, for the most part, read-only. That's so it can maintain fast boot times and high reliability. If they let you install any program you wanted, then the OS would have to pull in tons of dependencies, uh, it would fill up the tiny disk partition that it lives in, and it could slow down the boot process and maybe even destabilize the OS. And all of this defeats the point. You're not supposed to think of this as an OS. It wants to be an appliance. It should turn on without question anytime you power up the machine. It should boot almost immediately and then it should perform a few tasks with absolute consistency. That's what hyperspace does. And for the average individual, that's more or less a good thing. But of course, it makes nerds like us want to run for the hills. This OS is useless to nerds. You can't open a terminal on this. There's no X term. And yes, they did disable control alt F1. So you have no control over this system. You can't change any settings that aren't exposed in the GUI. And what is exposed is of course limited to, you know, Wi-Fi, UI language, that sort of thing. You can't install or upgrade any software. And all of that is meant to protect the OS from you. But curiously, hyperspace only protects itself. Let me show you what I mean. We're gonna open the app you've all been curious about. Files. This is the file browser, and it's a virtually unmodified copy of Nautilus, which was the standard GNOME file browser at that time. Uh, in fact, they didn't even bother removing the GNOME icon from the corner. This is kind of an odd thing about hyperspace. It has a decent amount of polish where it counts, but it's kind of weird that they didn't bother rebranding any of these utilities. All the other instant on OSs that I've looked at used tons of free software just like this, but they all rebranded it to hide its origins. Of course, there's no good reason to do that, but it's pretty conventional corporate behavior. And I'm kind of puzzled as to why Phoenix didn't do this. It kind of makes me think that this was developed in a skunk works of some kind with very little oversight. But that's not to say that these apps haven't been modified. This file browser cannot show you the root file system. You can't navigate into the hyperspace environment itself. Instead, the tree starts at My Documents, and that's literally the Windows My Documents folder. Here, we can go to desktop. Well, there's nothing there. Let's go look at documents. There we go. This is my Windows My Documents folder. You can even go up to C drive here and you can view the entire contents of the hard drive or any other hard drives. Now, of course, most of this has no file associations. So if we click on a file, 
Oh, actually, that one had an association. Terrific. That opened in the text editor. Most other stuff won't. I think if we go find like an image, are there any images on here? Is there still a media folder inside the Windows folder? Let's see. Files. Can we play a MIDI? Oh, it's opening the media player. Is this going to work? I haven't tried this. Ah, I can't play it. No MIDI. At that point, why even, why even sell the computer? What's the point? Oh, here we go. Here's a JPEG. Will this open? Well, it opened in the web browser, but it did open. See, I don't know all the things that this supports, and the drive is read-only, but this is still incredibly useful. If Windows won't boot, but you direly need to access a file off your hard drive, well, if it's a document that this has an association for, you can just open it. So if it's something you need to look at in a text editor, for instance, that'll obviously work. Or if you need to extricate it to another machine, you can just copy it straight off to a USB drive. And I was super mad when I found out that Asus ExpressGate didn't include this functionality because I thought, why the hell would you put a second operating system on a machine and not offer even the most basic recovery features? So it's nice that they did this, but it goes further. You might be aware that in the late 2000s, it was still considered a bit unwise for a Linux system to write data onto an NTFS partition. I'm pretty sure that was still true in 2010, but hyperspace will let you do it, at least inside your Windows user directory. It won't let you touch anything else on the drive, which was probably a good idea for the sake of safety, but this means that anything you find on a website when you're using the browser, for instance, you can save to the hard drive and then access from Windows. And that's pretty neat. But that's pretty much it for the software tour. My biggest impression of hyperspace is that it's pretty rich. It's been a consistent feature in this series that the developers of these instant on environments rip out way more functionality than they really needed to. Uh, for instance, why didn't Asus ExpressGate include a calculator? I realize it's just supposed to be an instant on web browser, but why not include a calculator? What the hell is that? It's free. It's like 12 kilobytes. There's no dependencies, you clowns. It's actually been a genuine viewpoint of mine for most of my life that any device with a CPU, a screen, and a keypad should have a calculator feature. Thermostats should have this. It's free. Just do it. Come on. Well, Phoenix was a lot more liberal in that regard than most other developers, so that's cool. Honestly, the software package here is outstanding. There is a calculator and a text editor and a complete office suite. This feels a lot more like you know, a really basic contemporary Linux distro, like Mint or something, than it does an airport sign-in kiosk, like some of the other Instant On systems. So it's really cool that Phoenix made this as capable as it is. But, like I said, there's no features for nerds. You're locked into this environment. There's no way to punch out and get any kind of control over the system. I even put a few hours into poking through config dialogues and trying every key combo, every trick I could think of, and I couldn't find any way to jailbreak this thing. There aren't any exploits. They seem to have done a decent job covering them all up. And that bugs me. No matter what Phoenix's intentions were, I think it's criminal for someone to make a Linux-based operating system that's not an airport kiosk, something that's meant to be owned by an individual that does not offer any kind of advanced mode. There should be a checkbox, a button buried 10 dialogues deep in a place nobody would think to look for it unless they knew it was there, that lets you open a terminal so you can do emergency maintenance on a machine that's otherwise hosed. Hyperspace is so close to being a normal copy of Linux. It's so raw compared to its competition that it was actually bugging me that it couldn't do this. So I took the time to break into it. I figured out how to mount the partition from another OS, modified the init scripts, and added a copy of Xterm and set that to launch instead of the kiosk interface, and I was able to take control of the system. So there it is and it's kind of amazing how quickly the mirage dissipates. Hyperspace, as shipped, looks so much like some unique OS, some thing of its own, but you're really just looking at one program, the whole widget panel and all that forced full screen behavior. That's just an init script. Once you get rid of that, it just turns into a normal 2010s desktop Linux. The window manager is even normal. It's just comp is. It even has some of the fun little animations still turned on. Whoop. <laughs> God, it did that. I also learned that Phoenix didn't even modify the apps to force them to be full screen. They left them as they were and used a tool called Devil's Pie. What? Uh, that lets you dictate where programs appear on your screen and what capabilities they have. I didn't know this program existed. You can write little scripts for it that say, for instance, make sure every X chat window is permanently stuck in the lower left corner of the screen at these exact dimensions and can't be resized. Stuff like that. 
I bet some people out there would really like that capability. So th there you go, a little present for you. But the point is that hyperspace, like most instant on OSs, is just Linux. And it's almost disheartening to see that because it could have been so useful if Phoenix had added a jailbreak button, you know, let you hold shift on startup to get a shell, something like that. But despite that limitation, I think you can tell from my general tone of voice and the remarkably small number of cusses in this video so far that I actually like this product. I wouldn't use it. I'm way too much of a power hungry nerd for that, but I respect what Phoenix was doing here. I think they made a lot of great choices. And for the majority of non-power users, especially in the era before iPad ubiquity, this really seems like an accomplishment that people could have used. Even more impressive, I think they actually planned to provide updates. Most instant on OSs were doomed to be stuck with a 2008 vintage copy of Firefox forever, since they were generally read only unless you ran an update utility provided by your hardware vendor. That is not by the people who made the instant on OS, but by Lenovo or HP or whoever. There was no way 90% of users were ever going to do that, even given the option, and even less chance that the vendors were going to bother releasing updates on any kind of schedule or for longer than a year. But after I gained access to the file system in this thing, I discovered a package manager that was pointed to some Phoenix repos. Now they're not up anymore, so I don't know what was on them, but I think this company actually intended to deliver updates directly instead of relying on vendors. So if this market had had any kind of actual legs, if anybody wanted an instant on OS to begin with, hyperspace probably would have been the shining star. I've always been critical of Linux's ability to perform as a desktop OS without needing you to get up into the goddamn thing's guts and edit text files until it behaves right. And it was a lot worse 13 years ago than it is now. Phoenix was able to wrangle 2010s era Linux into something that was both consumer accessible, possibly sustainable, and in my opinion, downright pleasant to look at. So my hat's off in those regards. But in 2010, it was assumed that you couldn't spend all your time in an alternative OS. Sooner or later, you were gonna have to get into Windows, and that meant you were gonna have to dual boot. That's a theme of this series. I said it right from the beginning. Nearly all the Instant On solutions were pretty much just factory installed dual boot OS setups. That's a pretty unusual thing to see in a consumer PC. Generally, dual booting is something that only nerds do. I was doing it in 2001. Tons of you are doing it right now. It's not hard to set up, but you only see it on computers owned by people who know enough to make things harder for themselves. There are plenty of reasons that the average computer user would never want to dual boot. Let's go through a few. Uh, first off, the average individual sees no value in it. Their machine came with Windows. It does everything they want, case closed. Nothing more to discuss. But suppose someone decides they'd like some of the benefits of Linux, whatever they are. Well, then they run smack into problem number two. They have to know how it works. You and I might value our time so little that we're willing to learn two completely different operating systems, or four, or nine, but most people are too busy actually working on their computers for all that nonsense. So then we come to problem number three. Sooner or later, they'll run into something that demands Windows. Open source people love to say that you can do anything under Linux, and that's more true nowadays since everything's just a web page. But in the 2000s, that claim never survived contact with printer drivers, documents you need to digitally sign, anything your job or school needs you to run, or many other situations where someone doesn't have the option of crossing their arms and saying, well, I just won't do that then. And finally, we have problem number four. Dual booting requires you to reboot. It's right there in the name. And that sucks. To leave Windows and go to Linux, you have to wait two or three or four minutes to shut down and start back up. And if you have anything open, you have to close that. And if you wanna go back to Windows, you have to do it all over again, close everything, reopen everything. Over the years, every time that I've tried to dual boot, it lasted until the first time that I had to jump into Windows to do something and then went back to Linux afterwards and then had to go back to Windows again, not an hour later. After that, I just stayed in Windows and that's how that experiment ended. I've been doing this about once a year for over 20 years. So in short, virtually every product in this series was unnecessary, unfamiliar, and inconvenient to the average user. If you could run this as your only OS, it might have had value, but you couldn't. And the reality is nobody was ever gonna go, oh, 
I think I'll boot up the PC. Let's pick the weird half-ass OS, the one that'll save me 30 seconds up front, then make everything I do for the next four hours way less convenient. They might try it once or twice, but the first time that even a know-nothing average user is forced to go back to Windows, that's it. They're never touching this again. If, however, big if, if people could jump back and forth between the two OSs seamlessly without closing anything and with no delays, they might bother. But that doesn't matter because it's just impossible. Phoenix recognized this and came up with several terrifying solutions. In fact, they were so brazen about it that I had a hard time writing this script. I mean, where do I put the big reveal for the video if in order to get to it, I first have to say something like, Phoenix wanted companies to ship consumer PCs with a hypervisor. You gotta understand, that's not a spoiler. That's not the horrific hack that powers this device here. That deeply disturbing hell phrase, consumer grade hypervisor, is the teaser for the crimes that Phoenix committed. That's how hell bent for leather they were. Let me explain. Hyperspace came in three flavors. The first one just installed as a secondary OS. You could pick it from your Windows boot menu and it looked exactly like what I just showed you. That's all that was. There was no reason to ever launch that, and I assure you, nobody ever even installed it. But then they had Hyperspace Hybrid Edition, and that had a very impressive feature. You could be in Windows, and at any moment, you could press a button and be inside Hyperspace, instantly. I don't mean like the trick we saw at the beginning of this video. That took like 20 seconds. I'm talking about, you press a button, you're in hyperspace in one second. You do whatever you want, however long you want, then you press the button again, and one second later, you're back in Windows and all your programs are still running. That's impossible, but they managed it, sort of. The way this worked was, they installed Zen Hypervisor on your PC, put hyperspace in a virtual machine, and Windows in another. Now, you either know what a VM is, and I don't need to explain why this is terrifying, or you don't, and I need to make you understand so you never independently invent this. Virtualization is a time-honored technique with lots of advantages, and it's very impressive. It's pretty close to the truth to say that virtualization allows multiple operating systems to share the same PC with each one thinking it has total control of the system and all its resources, when in fact they're being shared seamlessly among all the OSs. It's very close to the truth, but it isn't the truth. There's enough of a gap. If you put Windows inside a VM, it is no longer talking directly to your hardware. It gets to use the CPU pretty much like normal, but everything else, from your mouse and keyboard to your graphics card, are going through an extra layer of abstraction. This can work pretty well, but you do lose performance and you do run into limitations. I've never seen hyperspace hybrid, so I can't tell you whether it performed mostly well or not, but I can say the biggest problem, just to pick one, would have been the graphics. When Linus Tech Tips does some absurd stunt with virtual machines, it works as well as it does because they use hardware pass-through to give each VM direct access to a physical graphics card, so it isn't going through a software emulation layer. Doing that on a laptop would have required two GPUs with a single output, which you never find in low-end laptops. High-end machines had it, but they also had fast CPUs and hard drives, so an instant on OS made no sense. So Phoenix couldn't do it that way. Thus, Hyperspace used the usual VM solution. It exposed a dummy graphics driver to Windows, and whatever got written to that basic frame buffer was picked up by the hypervisor and copied to the real graphics card, uh, assuming that VM was active at the moment. That's the magic of virtualization, the ability to share unshareable hardware. The problem is it defeats hardware acceleration, which has been crucial for computer graphics since the mid 90s. A basic frame buffer driver has no acceleration whatsoever, so it's gonna be god-awful slow, basically unusable above about 1024 by 768. It'll also have no DirectX support, so presumably this never would have supported Windows Aero or any form of 3D graphics, and other hardware would have had similar problems. USB devices could be passed through more or less normally, but I've seen that have problems before, and if you had any kind of specialized sound card capabilities, for instance, that's never gonna work. Your Wi-Fi is just gonna show up as a generic ethernet port. It's a mess, and as far as I know, there are no solutions to these problems, certainly not back in 2010. This is just a bad idea, okay? Virtualization belongs in data centers. Putting some poor bastard's whole OS inside a VM is a prank. It's some Truman Show shit. It's disassembling the coach's car and putting it back together inside the gym. It's not remotely worth the trouble, and it probably didn't work. 
most of the info on this stuff has been lost to time because surprise, surprise, this was a colossal flop, who knew? I think this Samsung is one of maybe three computers to ever shipped with hyperspace at all, and this is not the hybrid version. As far as I can tell, hybrid never made it into anything except as an installer that you could get from Phoenix's website, and we'll never know how that worked because once you got the installer, it then phoned home to get the actual files. Nobody archived those, so they're gone forever, so I can't test this software and see if it actually worked, but I have to believe that it didn't. The fantasy though, was that you'd use Windows to author a presentation in your hotel room or whatever, and then when you're done with the heavy lifting, when the workday is over, you hit a button, the Windows VM gets suspended, so it's no longer eating CPU cycles, and then you can squeeze another three hours out of your battery doing lightweight web browsing in hyperspace. Because see, one of the other claims of hyperspace was longer battery life. We can see that on the sticker here, right there, says longer battery life. Okay, on a netbook where long battery life was a primary feature, that does carry some weight if it can deliver. But does it? No. And to my surprise, I was actually able to test that empirically because if you can believe this, the battery in this 13-year-old computer that only cost like $400 new still holds a full charge. So I ran hyperspace on the battery for two hours and it only got down to about 70%. Simple math says that's about a six hour runtime, which is about right for this machine. I then switched over to Windows, I left it running, and I got another four hours. So there you go. I didn't do a complete charge and drain in both modes because I'm not that patient. I'm probably not even gonna shoot the B-roll for it for this video, just trust me, I did it. It sure looks though like Windows and Hyperspace get about the same battery life. Now to be fair, I wasn't doing much during that test. I didn't actually carry the machine around using it to browse the web or anything. I didn't have a way to simulate use conditions, so I just left it idling. And I felt that that probably told us most of what we needed to know. But to test further, I removed the battery, I connected the power supply through a kilowatt meter, and I monitored power consumption at idle and while running various applications. There seems to be a minor difference at best. At idle, it's around 10 to 12 watts in either OS, and when using a web browser, for instance, it's around 11 to 14. I'll grant that under Windows, I've seen higher numbers, particularly when, for instance, you're installing a program. I was seeing figures as high as 16 watts, but I don't think that counts since you can't do that activity in hyperspace. It doesn't really compare. I would say that power consumption under Windows is maybe five to 10% higher. And okay, that's 20, 25 minutes off your total battery life. That matters, but it's not really worth all this hassle, dual booting and switching back and forth between your OS's for 20 minutes. Now, maybe I'm not seeing the true numbers. The complex circuitry and capacitance and the power supply could be throwing things off, but if there was a major difference, I think we'd seen it. I honestly think that these OS's mostly just perform about the same. At this point in time, Linux was probably getting better at energy management, especially on laptops. And we'd seen hints in past episodes that however bloated Windows might have seemed, even Vista didn't appear to have egregious power consumption. I think it was way more optimized than people give it credit for, and Windows 7 even more so. So, even assuming that adding a hypervisor to your machine didn't punch up the resource utilization all on its own, we can trust that hyperspace hybrid wouldn't actually have helped with your battery life. As usual, with all the instant on OSs, this was a tremendous waste of time. But none of that bothered Phoenix, who went on to develop yet another version, and that's the one we have here. It's called Hyperspace Dual, and the way it works is so batshit that it makes hybrid look as vanilla as Microsoft Office. All right, let's watch Hyperspace do its thing again, like we saw at the beginning of the video, but this time we'll pay a little more attention. Uh, we're here in Windows 7. Let's go ahead and just uh, get some crap going. We'll open a browser. And we'll just go to a website here, something this machine can handle. My website, for instance. Hey, look at that. It's about this. It's really about her. Let's go open some other stuff. Uh, how about that casual gaming center thing? Let's do that. All right, I'm not going to start one of these games. I'm not quite that ambitious. But let's go ahead now and switch to hyperspace. All right, here we are, that took about 20 seconds. So let's go ahead and open some crap in hyperspace too. All right, here we are, same page, there she is again. And now I'm gonna go up to the status bar here, I'm gonna hit the Windows icon. And we're back, and all my programs are still open. See if I pull up Firefox here, 
There she is. And we can go back the other way. I'm gonna hit the icon again. And we're back. And there she is. So this delivers on the fantasy. Assuming, of course, that your fantasy is saving one to two watts, it actually delivers it. But it's not running a hypervisor and computers don't have a method for doing what we just did. If you go to Stack Exchange and ask how to do this, everyone will tell you that you can't. And they're right. This isn't a thing. Switching between operating systems in under 30 seconds, you can't do that. So how the hell does it work? Well, there was actually a clue. You saw a clue. It explains so much about this and it's what put me on the scent. I wouldn't have figured this out if I hadn't noticed it, at least not very quickly. I'm sure a bunch of you noticed it too and you're probably hollering at your screens that you know how it works. You're almost right, but you aren't right and nobody can blame you because what you just witnessed has never happened now or before. It is utterly unique and beautiful in its simplicity. And I will sadly have to talk about ACPI tables and interrupt vectors to explain it. I'm very sorry, but please stay with me. It's worth it. The clue is that the screen faded out. Windows only does that when you shut down, hibernate, or go to sleep. In fact, if we check the event logs, we find that yes, indeed, Windows says that it went to sleep, not to hibernate. I bet you didn't see that one coming. If you guessed at the answer, then you probably guessed that Windows is hibernating. That is, it's saving all active memory to a file on the disk, and then the PC reboots and loads a separate hibernate file uh, with a saved state for the other OS and vice versa. And there's precedent for this. We actually just saw it in the last video, the one about Dell's Media Direct OS. That does, in fact, keep a whole second operating system continuously available in the form of a saved hibernation file that's always lurking there on the hard drive. And nothing stops you from hibernating the primary OS and then booting back up into the other one. The problem is that isn't fast enough to do this. Uh, Windows would have to power down all your peripherals, wait for them to settle, sync all your open file handles, write out at least a gig of system RAM to your little 5400 RPM spinning disk, reboot, post, execute the bootloader, find the hyper file for the second OS and load it all back into RAM, a whole gig of data in the space of 20 seconds. No. That doesn't work. Even if the BIOS was gimmicked to have some ultra fast post mode for just this purpose, the numbers don't make sense. Yes, I meant the word gimmicked. That's a word, it's in the dictionary, go look it up. Definition two. But here's the thing. You know what makes hyperspace incredibly special? It's the only instant on OS that was developed by a BIOS company. In 2010, Phoenix was still relevant. They were shipping firmware on tons of PCs, so they knew the PC architecture inside and out because they were coding directly against the metal. They had to know every inch of it. And one thing the BIOS is intimately involved in is power management. On the PC, power is managed by a system called ACPI that lives in the BIOS. When you power up, power down, go to sleep, or go to hibernate, you're switching between power states. These all have names. Normal operation, when the machine is just on, is called S0. Power off is S5. And in between, you have S1, 2, 3, and 4. S4 is hibernate. That's, again, where system memory gets written to disk and the machine powers off completely. S1 through S3, however, are different forms of what we usually call sleep. And what those do is they power down most of the system hardware, usually including the CPU, but they keep your RAM alive. So when your PC is in sleep, it is mostly turned off. The CPU is inert, it's not getting any power. The only thing that's still juiced is the memory. So when you return from sleep, the CPU wakes up knowing nothing. It's like it was just turned on for the first time that day. It doesn't remember that it was running an operating system or what processes were active. And that's normal for a CPU. They don't really know anything except what's going on at one specific picosecond of time. While your PC is running, your CPU is constantly being interrupted and having all of its work yanked away and replaced with a completely different task that it's expected to just pick up and work on. And this happens over and over and over. It's called context switching and it's the fundamental basis of multitasking. It happens some inconceivable number of times per second the whole time that your PC is running. So CPUs are expected to be able to forget what they're doing, then come back later and pick up like nothing happened. But if your machine's been turned off, then something has to remind the CPU where to pick up. ACPI does this. When you tell Windows to go to sleep, it has a bunch of housekeeping it has to do. It has to suspend processes, tell your hardware to power down, write out any pending data to mass storage, and a bunch of other stuff. But once that's all done, Windows halts, hands over control to ACPI, and tells it, 
to EP, time for S3. ACPI then makes some notes about where the CPU instruction pointer was, what was in the registers, and the state of any hardware that was still powered up, and then it shuts off the CPU. Later on, when you wake the machine, it powers on and it has no idea what it was doing before. So its first task is to ask ACPI, hey bud, what was I doing? At this point, all your programs, and all of Windows for that matter, are sitting in system memory, but frozen. They're there, but they have no control. The CPU has no reason to jump back into any of that code. It doesn't even know it's there. Your process memory maps were part of Windows. If Windows isn't running, then it's all just bytes in memory, random data. Your OS relies on the BIOS, on ACPI, to tell the CPU to jump back into its code so it can light up your peripherals, spin up the hard drives, and go back to running all its processes. Windows trusts the BIOS. What would happen if the BIOS broke its promises? All right. It's time for the nitty gritty. Uh, this is the stuff I don't even really understand, so I'm just gonna give you the outline and hope I get it right. It's like this. On every machine, the BIOS has something called the E820 table, which tells all the software on your system what areas of memory are used for what purpose. In this table, you can define, among other things, reserved memory. Now, I'm pretty sure that's how you tell the OS stuff like, hey, there's a graphics card using this range of RAM, so don't use it to store processes. When a machine with hyperspace dual boots up, there's a bit of code, I think it's built into the BIOS on this machine, or it can load from the MBR on the hard drive, but it runs before anything else. And it's actually a heavily modified copy of the Linux bootloader, Grub, but they call it the OSM, or OS Steering Module. That proceeds to edit the E820 table and reserve a huge chunk of memory. Uh, this varies, you can adjust it, but let's assume it's the default, 256 megs. Once that's done, it looks for a flag uh, that tells it whether you want to boot into Windows or hyperspace by default. If you choose Windows, then it boots pretty much like normal. That means that the Windows kernel begins loading itself into system memory starting at the lowest practical address, and it begins stacking up all the parts of the kernel and the drivers and so on. First come, first serve. It's just filling up memory all in a row. Now, once you reach your desktop, if you look in Task Manager, you'll see that your PC that's supposed to have one gig only has 768 megs of RAM. That reserved memory is non-existent as far as your OS is concerned. Okay, now, reboot and choose hyperspace instead. Something weird happens behind the scenes. Hyperspace doesn't load itself into the lowest part of memory. It loads itself into that specific 256 meg chunk. You getting the picture yet? <laughs> is this coming clear? <laughs> When you boot hyperspace, the OSM flips the numbers. Instead of hiding that 256 meg segment, it hides all the other memory. So the whole OS loads itself in that little area of RAM and it looks around and goes, damn, 256 megs, is this a Pentium 3? But other than that little oddity, the OS boots like any other copy of Linux. So now you're sitting at the hyperspace desktop and you hit the button to boot Windows. What happens now? Hyperspace calls back that little grub bootloader. It's still living in memory. It hid itself in system RAM, like a TSR from the DOS days. Hyperspace reaches out and tells it, hey, time to go to Windows, and then it just goes to sleep. It performs a completely ordinary Linux sleep procedure, and when it's all done, it tells the ACPI BIOS, hey, time to go to S3, and ACPI catches that request, throws it away, and begins to alter the universe. See, you gotta ask yourself, how do you know your memories are yours? How do you know what you really know? What are your objective experiences worth if you can't trust your senses? Trust that your memory is an unbroken chain of actual events. And what exactly is reality if we don't agree that what we see is what happened and everything happens because of something else? What if the fundamental assumptions of causality fell out from under your feet and the world stopped behaving according to plan? Well, who cares? You can't sit around worrying about that kind of stuff. If the universe stops following its own rules, well, you're screwed anyway, right? And what are the chances? This never happens to anyone else. Why would it happen to you? So you assume that a brick wall will stop a car and thus you don't drive into one. Likewise, your OS believes that when it goes to sleep, the machine will power off. And when it wakes up, the ACPI routines will program the CPU registers and resume execution in its own code because it has to believe this. It's cause and effect. It must happen that way. But here it doesn't. Linux halts, but your PC never goes to sleep. The machine's still on, but there's no OS running. Instead, the OSM is in charge. 
The sleep process depends on the assumption that you can put return vectors into the ACPI tables and they'll be there unaltered when the machine resumes. But Ron Burgundy will read anything you put on his teleprompter. So OSM reaches into the ACPI tables and changes them. It alters which part of memory is cordoned off. It swaps the little chunk for the big chunk. And then it changes the CPU resume vectors. So instead of pointing to hyperspace's little tent in the corner of RAM, they point back to the normal system bootloader code. Then it simply returns the PC from S3. It skips the power off step completely, forces the machine back into S0, and lets the CPU wake up to find itself executing the Windows bootloader. No, bud, no, no, this is what you were doing. He gaslights the CPU. The system proceeds to boot normally. Windows loads the kernel, drivers, processes, etc., and it gets you to a desktop, and the whole time, there's an entire second operating system lingering in memory, inert and invisible. Windows doesn't know it's there. It's in the dead space. So now Windows is booted and it's running normally and you want to go back to hyperspace. So the whole process happens again. You click the icon, the utility sets a little flag somewhere in memory that says user wants to switch to hyperspace and then it tells Windows to go to sleep. And when Windows tells the BIOS, okay, time for S3, the OSM once again jumps in, does the swap -a and the CPU wakes back up to find itself executing hyperspace again. You proceed to compute as normal, and there's no indication that there's an entire copy of Windows 7 mummified in system memory. Except that if you go to shut down, it tells you it first has to shut down Windows, and sure enough, it switches over to Windows, goes through that shutdown process, then comes back to hyperspace and performs a second shutdown there. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. I can't deny it. And all the same, these are those wrongs darker than death or night. I began this series by promising to tell you about the last gasp of truly original thought on the PC platform. Well, you did ask for it, didn't you? The monkey's paw curled. This is what I've brought back from the dead where it belonged. And I did it all for you. A million hands gripped this blade. I can't even really explain what's so wretched about this. It's, it's all documented behavior. It works. You saw it work. It should work. But it shouldn't be done. And I can only explain with the tone of my voice and the fear in my eyes. This is not what we should be doing with computers, okay? This is not made. This should never be made. It's nightmarish. Windows thinks it's going to sleep. It closes its eyes, it passes out, and then its body gets up, goes out into the night, and commits murders it'll never remember. I got all this from Phoenix's patents, by the way. It's actually very plainly worded, so I'm pretty confident that I got it right. Uh, in fact, uh, the patent even puts the right amount of mustard on the description of the process. Listen to this. At this point, the behavior of OSM diverges greatly from the action normally involved in entering ACPI state S3. For having taken many of the same actions that precede ACPI state S3, the OSM proceeds instead to create and save a further restorable hardware context and set of wake vectors in preparation for loading a second OS. The weight of these two phrases diverges greatly and proceeds instead <laughs> makes me shiver. I can't get over this. It's, it's a software rug pull. It's making the Statue of Liberty disappear. In several figurative senses, this is a funny trick to play on God. When the patent says described below, I think that below is hell. But I can't deny that it works. It has worked every time I've tried it, and I kind of can't imagine why it wouldn't. That's the real kicker. I have nothing else to tell you about how this functions because it is as simple as clicking an icon and getting a reliable result. So now we have to somehow tear ourselves away from this spectacle and finish the video, which is a real bummer because the only story that remains is one additional crime and a sad ending. It's Chinatown, Jake. Here's uh, the crime. Uh, I mentioned earlier that it was not super advisable, at least at this point in history, to write to a Windows disk partition from within Linux. You could do it, it was possible, but it wasn't something you wanted to put in the hands of random users. And more importantly, you couldn't do it safely on a disk that was actively mounted. So think about that. When you boot Windows, it mounts the NTFS partition. That means that it opens the master file table and a bunch of file handles. Uh, maybe it writes some preliminary data to that, you know, opens some files that it's going to eventually write to and close when it eventually shuts down. And it stores all that information in memory. It stores assumptions about all that stuff. Then, when it goes to write some data to the disk, it assumes that what it remembers about the disk is still true, because Windows has total control over the file system as long as it's running. But you see, we've played a trick on Windows here. We can suspend it, then launch another OS that can touch that same file system. And Windows can't stop it, and it can't know that that happened. 
See, normally if you say power your machine off by pulling the plug and then try and mount your NTFS drive from Linux, the driver is smart enough to complain that the disk was not unmounted cleanly. In other words, Windows has left some file handles open and uh, sort of left a note for itself that says, hey, whoa, hold on, this, this might not be right. So before you do anything, run some checks, make sure the file system isn't hosed. The problem is Windows only runs those checks on startup. So if hyperspace reaches out and changes some crap in your Windows folder while it's suspended, when you switch back to Windows, it's gonna have no idea that happened. And this will lead to profound disk corruption pretty much instantly. And this isn't really a tractable problem. You shouldn't try to fix this. Even if there is a theoretical solution, you shouldn't apply it directly to the forehead or otherwise. This should be left alone, shunned. Do not mess around with these things. You are begging for trouble. But the bad boys at Phoenix were undeterred because sure enough, they came up with the only solution that really makes sense despite how stupid it is. Here, first off, let me show you that you really can do this. Let's go to the Files app, get a USB drive here. And uh, let's see, yeah, here's an installer for DirectX 8.1. Let's just copy that over, paste. Now let's flip back into Windows. And there's the DirectX 8.1 installer folder. So sure enough, it did copy that data over to Windows for really real. How can it do this safely? Well, okay, so hyperspace has a little partition all to itself on the hard drive, of course, and that uses the Linux extended file system. So it's hard for Windows to look at it, but not impossible. You can read Linux file systems from Windows if you have the right driver, but that partition is hidden from Windows using an obnoxious technique that isn't worth detailing in this video, but we will take just a moment because it is one of the other original Phoenix software products that was being developed at the time. It was called Firstware, and a few people watching this will immediately recognize that because it was bought almost exclusively by IBM and later Lenovo and used heavily in their contemporary ThinkPads. But it was actually a general commercial product that I think a few other vendors made use of, including, of course, Phoenix themselves. The purpose of Firstware was basically to create a indestructible utility partition on a hard drive using a combination of an ATA feature called the host protected area and a kind of secondary secret funnier partition table that was stored at the end of the drive instead of the beginning. These technologies were, I shit you not, called beer and parties. This company was clearly run by clowns, but we knew that. Well, with the right tools, Windows is capable of reading a partition that's been hidden by HPA, obfuscated by beer and parties, and running a Linux file system. So in theory, hyperspace could just buffer all the user's attempted writes to the disk by storing them in its own partition, and then when you resumed Windows, it could copy those files out of the partition and into the real Windows file system. But, well, then what happens if you try and move 20 gigs of stuff? The Phoenix partition is maybe 600 megs, and most of that's taken up by the OS, so there's nowhere to stage all this data. Instead, if I understand correctly, it actually does write your data right into the NTFS file system, corrupting it from Windows's point of view. But it then writes a journal of those changes into its own partition. And when you go back to Windows, there's a little shim that they injected into the resume process that pauses the wake up, reads that journal file, and makes whatever updates to the file system need to be made. And I'm honestly not really sure how that solves the problem, but dag nab, it works too, as far as I can tell, you just saw it work. I wanna get mad at this. I know it's the wrong solution in some way. It must be fragile. It must break in so many situations, but I can't tell you what they are. So I, I guess my complaints don't much matter, do they? In the end, this works. The question is, does it do anything that anyone wanted? I'd say no, and for the same reasons that we keep seeing over and over in this series. First off, hyperspace just doesn't boot that much faster than Windows. 30 versus 60 seconds, I ain't that impressed. Secondly, it's using sleep to speed itself up. Why install a second OS and put that to sleep when you could just put the primary OS to sleep and get the same or better advantages, as we saw earlier? And finally, this uses at best 10% less power than Windows, and I don't think that math would have made this make sense for anyone just for longer battery life. And that's why it's not surprising that nobody ever cared about this thing. Hyperspace was announced sometime in 2008. It got reported on by one or two nameless online news columns. 
didn't ship until 2010. And by the time this laptop hit the market, Phoenix had actually already given up and sold most of what they'd bought or built in their applications division to other companies. Hyperspace went to Hewlett Packard and the next time anyone saw it, it had been stripped of its identity and anything else to make it noteworthy. If you watched episode two, you'll recall that I briefly showed off an HP machine at the end with a feature called Quick Web. That was based on Splashtop, the same OS that most people knew as Asus ExpressGate, uh, which we saw in that episode, but a year or so after that came out, HP put out some new machines that also had Quick Web, except they'd quietly swapped out the Splashtop base for hyperspace. Unfortunately, the result was nowhere near as interesting. If you remember the beginning of this video, you'll recall I had this sitting on the desk and I told you it was turbo boring. This is an HP EliteBook 2560P and it's not even really worth describing. This machine is incredibly ordinary for the time. I'm not even gonna bother listing the hardware specs because we ain't gonna be here very long. It has a Core i5 for whatever that's worth. Anyway, what we're here for is this button above the keyboard that has a picture of a globe on it. Click, there we go. This is Quick Web. Naturally, it boots up directly into a browser, as the name suggests. We can go to my website, and here we are again. It's her. But we can close this, and we get this entirely new user interface. This is, again, a widget interface, although obviously it's uh, all been rewritten from scratch, and it's worse. Uh, the status bar here offers us shortcuts for Skype, a mail client, and the browser. And that's it, there's no other software on here. No Office Suite, no text editor, you can't access the hard drive, there's no data interchange with Windows. It doesn't even have real player. It doesn't even have Solitaire. This is almost as limited as ExpressGate was. It looks a little nicer and it does at least have a rich email client. Let's open that up. This is a basically unmodified copy of uh, Mozilla Thunderbird, which was a popular mail client at the time. Uh, but they've done something to it because it won't connect to my IMAP server. I don't have any idea why it gives some weird error about maximum number of connections. I have been pointing every single old mail client I have at this server and they all connect except for this one. So they must have broken something, but even if it did work, you could tell it would just be an ordinary mail client. And that's pretty much the only rich software that's on here. This is a pale shadow of what hyperspace was meant to be. It doesn't even compare to what we saw on the Samsung. And I honestly have no idea why HP even bothered with this. It seems to offer literally nothing to justify replacing Splashtop. I suspect that like with 99% of corporate IP acquisitions, HP had no idea what they bought and didn't know or care about any of its actual capabilities. Probably the only reason they bothered switching is because they'd spent a bunch of money, then the execs found out it was a total waste, and some departmental VP who was afraid of getting fired demanded a return on investment for his department no matter how pointless and empiric it all was. I think this version of Quick Web lasted maybe a year. And then HP gave up on the whole concept because by 2011, pretty much all the instant on OS's dried up. All this work went down the toilet. And over a decade passed before anyone noticed that it ever happened. Up until this moment, anyway, with you watching this video, that anyone was pretty much just me. The stories I tell on my channel, if I do a good job at least, are about works of great craftsmanship and creativity that fell between the cracks of the technological and consumer landscape and were forgotten. Sometimes for bad reasons, often for very good ones, but rarely because the inventors were unimaginative. What Phoenix pulled off here was a demo scene grade performance. This was masterful. It's a suite of brilliant, interconnected ways of abusing the PC platform. So clever that I can't even explain what about them makes me mad. It loops around the variable overflows. I love it, actually. And all of that didn't end up counting for anything because what they were pursuing with all this genius was fundamentally absurd. But man, it deserves to be remembered. Sometimes I feel like the job I took when I started this channel was witness more than anything. There were some clever people trying their hardest to make the world more interesting back in the early Obama years, and almost everything they did ended up on the cutting room floor of history. It's a shame their brilliance didn't end up benefiting any of us. I wish they'd gotten their due. This is my attempt to earn those folks at least some of the respect they deserve. I hope you had a good time witnessing with me. 
If you did, it would be great if you could subscribe so I know you're interested in this sort of thing. If you're enjoying this series, remember to turn on notifications so YouTube will maybe, possibly, if they're feeling like it today, let you know when the next episode goes up. But if you really liked it and wanna make sure there's more, consider supporting me on Patreon like these people are doing. They make all this possible. They pay for my laptops and other props, for my studio, and for my groceries and everything else. I am incredibly grateful to all of them for their support. I couldn't do this otherwise. Thank you all so much, and everyone else, thanks for watching.